next section, uh, Shanti Deva again comes back to the body and our relationship with the body, and again hits pretty strongly on uh, attachment to the body. Yeah. And you know, we in thinking about this, um, we may not be always be aware of how much. Uh, attachment to the body influences our life. Yeah. Because when we kind of, you know, we have food, we have comfortable beds, it's kind of, it's a bit hot yesterday, but cooler today. Uh, you know, kind of nice. Then if we just kind of mm, expect that the body is going to be comfortable and taken care of and food we have food and drink and so on and uh and yet in that kind of uh spaced outedness of not really uh looking at our relationship with the body then um a lot of attachment can fester and as we know the more attachment we have the more anger we have when we, when the body's uncomfortable, when we don't get what we want, and so on. Yeah. So your meditation uh, on the mindfulness of the body will come in very handy now. Yeah. But also, what Shanti Deva says may give you a, a different way to look look at that meditation too. Yeah. So. Let's start out by visualizing the lineage lamas and ourselves surrounded by all the sentient beings. And it's very helpful to think when we when we visualize all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and the lineage, you know, that these are all beings who have done what we aspire to do. So it's possible for us to do it too. Let's generate our motivation. So as we know, our self-centered thought is very sneaky. It pops up in all sorts of situations where we uh, aren't aware of it and where we may even be thinking what we're doing is something quite good. So one level of the self-centered thought is seeking our own awakening, our own freedom from samsara. And not following the bodhisattva path, but uh, wishing everybody well, but still seeking our own spiritual liberation. But in our lives now, a coarser form of self-centeredness drives so much of what we do, including our Dharma practice. 
And so we get very preoccupied with where am I sitting in relationship to others so that I will be noticed and uh, have my correct status understood. We're preoccupied with what can I study? Where can I study? Where can I do retreat? What retreat do I want to do? How do I arrange all the circumstances for my study? How do I arrange all the circumstances for my retreat? So it looks like Dharma practice, and there is some virtuous wish in there, but it's still all about me. And so we can even go through our Dharma life completely uh, insensitive to the effects of our actions on other people, to others' needs and concerns. Because it's all about me and my practice, and everybody else is somewhere in the background, depending on whether they help us get what we want or interfere with it. So recall what Shandi Deva has said about the defects of this self-centered attitude, how it really uh, sabotages everything good that we do. And sometimes makes us look quite foolish. So remember, the self-centered attitude is not who you are. So disparaging it is not disparaging ourselves. But think of its faults so that we can be free from it. and instead replace it with the wish to be a benefit and service to other living beings upon whom we depend all day and all night to stay alive, to provide all the things that we consume to keep us alive. Instead of ignoring them or taking them for granted, cultivating the 
determination to work for their benefit. And of course, the best way to do that is to attain full awakening, which will give us all the compassion and wisdom and qualities necessary to be of the greatest benefit. And so let's get on with doing that and stop the nonsense that our self-centered mind is creating with all of its petty things. Is your self-centered mind petty? Mine is. It's the smallest things. Yeah? Completely. This is intolerable. And I've got to do something about it immediately. Because Henny Penny said the sky is falling. And it might, unless I remedy this great injustice done to me that the world just doesn't appreciate. Anybody else have that problem? (laughs) So, here we go again. So we're near the end of the chapter now. So you might go, you know, we're on 174, there's only 187 that will be done. I'll stop this Thursday morning getting, you know, beaten up by Shanti Deva. And we'll go on to chapter 9 and live happily ever after. (laughs) But chapter 9 is going to tell us something that's sometimes even more radical. Yeah, like we don't exist the way we think we exist. Yeah. So we'll fight Shanti Deva in chapter nine too. Yeah. Okay, let's we'll start with one seventy three, because he's These verses are summing up some things, and then, like I said, he goes into the body some more. Likewise, if I wish to be happy, I should not be happy with myself. Okay, so maybe we better start the previous verse. Okay, for ages have you, the self-centered thought, dealt with me like this, and I have suffered long. So we're, uh, we're becoming aware that the self-centered thought is the, the actual problem, the actual enemy, and how we have suffered so much from it, that the self-centered thought makes, you know, it whispers in our ear, oh, you're the most important. Listen to me. I'll take good care of you. But actually, it betrays us. Okay? But now, recalling all my grudges against the self-centered thought, because we've looked at our life very thoroughly and seen all the ways, well, let's say all the ways, we've probably seen one or two ways in which the self-centered thought has made us miserable. We need to keep working at that to see all the ways. But now, recalling my grudges against the self-centered thought, I shall overcome your selfish thoughts. Okay. So it feels really good in meditation, doesn't it? You know, 
you've like seen the defects of your self-centered thought. Now you know like how you can appear obnoxious to other people and why sometimes people may not like you. Yeah, of course, maybe some of you never get that far. <laughs> maybe it's always, oh, those people are wrong because they don't like me. But, you know, sometimes you get to the thing where I can understand that, you know, because nobody likes somebody who's obnoxious. Yeah, yeah. I know you're all going, I'm not really obnoxious. She's just saying that. <laughs> She's trying to push my buttons. Yeah, that's what she does all the time. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So seeing, you know, in, in our meditation, we see the defects of the self-centeredness. We have very strong determination to combat it, right? I am not going to give into it. Uh, not even in the smallest thing. Yeah. And then as soon as class ends, even before class ends, yeah, we're chanting the dedication, and you're thinking, oh, that same person is out of pitch again. Yeah. Why don't they learn to chant like me? I'm always on pitch, right? Yeah. Now, nobody, nobody else has that thought. You don't notice the people who, who are off pitch? One, one, two people, three. Okay. Apparently, the people who are off pitch don't notice it. <laughs> okay. So we have very strong determination, yeah? and then we stand up, and it's time to rearrange the room, and we have something else we desperately need to do. So we can't help with that. Yeah. Then it's offering service time. But again, you know, we were just exhausted from yesterday offering service. So today we, we you know, we need a day off. Yesterday was a flex day, but I was kept busy petting cats. So I'm, <laughs> so I'm just too tired today. <laughs> I want to curl up like one of those cats and sleep all day. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, yeah, it's amazing, and 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 how much we don't notice how we're just uh, doing the same old, same old. Um, okay, so one seventy three. Likewise, if I wish to be happy, I should not be happy with myself. Why? Because of the self centered thought. Okay, and if I'm happy with the self-centered thought, I'm going to continue to create more and more obstacles for myself, and more and more unhappiness for myself and everybody else. So I shouldn't be happy with that self-centered thought. Yeah, and similarly, if I wish to be protected, I should constantly protect all others. Yeah. So instead of Going in every situation and like, uh, is this place safe? Am I okay? Are these people going to like me? What's going on here? You know, I think everybody in that situation is experiencing something similar. And wouldn't it be nice if I made them feel welcome? Yeah. If I did something to reach out, yeah. if I protected them. Mm -hmm. You know, when you live with a lot of bugs, <laughs> I live with a lot of bugs, yeah. My uh, upstairs in Prajna gets a lot of bugs. And you, or I, anyway, you start watching the bugs and you start thinking, you know, there's a consciousness inside those bugs. You know, there's a living being who wants to be happy and not suffer. 
you know, and in a previous life, we were very close. And now they're so limited by their body, you know, because when you have that kind of body, you know, there's plus the karma for the mind, you don't have any ability to understand the Dharma, to understand so many things. You know, I watched yesterday one spider outside. He was a very interesting looking spider, not one I want in my bed. Um, <laughs> it looks like the kind that would bite. Yeah. But anyway, and he was crawling up the side of the building. Yeah, and got to the very top and then went under the soffits. And I was thinking, he has no idea where he's going. Yeah, I mean, we get in a car, and I'm, I'm going from here to there. Yeah, he's like crawling up this place. He, he doesn't know where he's going, what he's going to encounter. And all he's looking for is some kind of safety yeah, and some food. And is he going to find safety under the soffits? Mm -hmm. So you know, I thought of moving him, but by the time I got my moving equipment for him, he had already, he was too high. I couldn't reach him anymore. You know? But to think, wow, there's a, a living being with a consciousness there that has the potential to become fully awakened, but he can't do anything towards that. And he can't even keep himself safe. Yeah. And then you turn around and there's, you know, a few more bugs, and they're in the same situation. Yeah. And then there's the cat. Yeah, same situation. Then you look around at the people. Yeah, same situation. Yeah. Except we human beings are we're kind of arrogant. Yeah, about over all the other life forms, you know, we're the best. Yeah. The Bible said God created all these living beings so that human beings can enjoy so Kill them, eat them, slaughter them, wear their hides. It's God's will. Yeah? And we believe that and we do that. Yeah. And these living beings suffer so much. And meanwhile, we're thinking about all our petty little things. Yeah. 174, to whatever degree I take great care of this body, to that degree I shall fall into a state of extreme helplessness. What in the world is he talking about? Yeah, I was taught. Weren't you taught to take care of your body? Yeah? Your body's so important. Take care of it. And then you won't be dependent on others. You will be able to do things yourself, you know, and then others can't uh, let you down. Yeah? That's often how we're raised. But here, what Shantideva is saying, okay? He's not saying ignore our body, make our body suffer. Yeah, that's not what he's saying at all. Yeah. But when we self-centered, with self-centeredness, take care of our body. Yeah. To that degree, then will wind up being very helpless. Yeah. Because the more we fuss over our body, yeah, then I mean it it brings problems with other people. It um we're never satisfied. Yeah. 
because this body is never satisfied. Yeah, when is your body ever satisfied? Think about it. We work so hard day and night just to, you know, for, even forget pleasure, just to keep this body alive. Yeah, and give it some modicum of of security. You know. And then on top of that, of course, we want all the the sensual pleasure we can get. But when is the body ever satisfied? Yeah, think about it. You know, at night you're exhausted, you fall into bed, and it's like, oh, this feels so good. And then if you just lie in bed, you know, at first it's like, oh, just lying down is good. But if you don't fall asleep right away, then it's like, oh, I'm not falling asleep. My mind is buzzing all over the place. Yeah, where's sheep number 58? I've got, I've got to count my sheep. You know, see, see, we need to get all of our Buddha bear friends back again, you know. Yeah. Sheep number 58. Yeah, I'm still not falling asleep. My body's uncomfortable lying here. I want to get up and do something. But I really want to go to sleep, but I'm not falling asleep. What's wrong with me that I'm not falling asleep? Okay. So it's, you know, it starts out just with the body. Then it's what's wrong with me? I'm not falling asleep. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's because I didn't get enough exercise today. Okay. So what am I going to do? Am I going to get up and exercise now? It's three in the morning. No. Then I'll get more exercise tomorrow. Then you start planning tomorrow. Let's see. I can get out of morning meditation by oversleeping because I'm exhausted, and then I'll go exercise, and then I'll be able to fall asleep tomorrow night. You know, I mean, just all this planning, all this worry. You know, if I don't get eight hours of sleep, yeah. I'm not going to be able to function. I'm going to get sick, and I'm going to die. Yeah. How about nine or ten hours of sleep? That's even better. Uh-huh. One of the <laughs> the first at the first meditation course I was at, there was one monk who was leading the meditations, and he was commenting on, you know, how we want to sleep for a long time. And then he said, and you're not even awake to enjoy it. And I realized, he's absolutely right. You know, we said, I want to sleep, I want to sleep. And you go to sleep. But do you enjoy sleeping? You're not awake to enjoy it. Yeah. But we're f- filled with so much fear. If I don't sleep enough, I'm going to get sick. If I don't sleep enough, I'm going to be in a bad mood. Yeah, I got to fall asleep, fall asleep, fall asleep, fall asleep. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, the body's hungry. I'm hungry again. I need to get up. Can't I have a a midnight snack? Yeah, I can't go in the refrigerator. They have rules about that. I'll go on the snack table. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll go get a snack. It's two o'clock in the morning. Everybody else is asleep. They won't notice. Clump, 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 clump. Who's walking in the hallway at two o'clock in the morning? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, I mean, just the way we cater to this body for everything. But to that degree, I shall fall into a state of extreme helplessness. Because, you know, when we're so attuned to every small thing the body wants or needs, we become helpless because how are we ever going to 
satisfy the body and get it everything it wants. Yeah, is your body ever satisfied with anything? Think about it. Yeah, I'll just keep trying and I'll wind up with the perfect meditation cushion. Yeah, so you try the blue one and the pink one and the chartreuse one and the square one and the hard one and the soft one and then you try a bench and then you sit on a chair and then you have a heating pad on your chair and none of that makes you happy yeah none of it the body is still like well you move this way move that way blow your nose yeah you finally get you're ready to meditate yeah then oh it's got to be a tick and then, no, it's going to be. And none of them are ticks. Have you noticed that? Yeah, that you're always like that, especially here because this, they like to come here and around your waist. And you're, uh, yeah, I'm meditating. You know? <laughs> and, and, you know, and you're waiting to catch that tick and you can't catch it. Yeah. Until. You're undressed in the shower, and then you see the tick. And what are you going to do with the tick then? Yeah? So then you got to find the tick container, and you need to put the tick, you know, and someone else is knocking on the door saying, you know, how dirty are you? You've been in the shower too long, you know, and you're sitting there, well, I'm just trying to you know, get rid of this tick, and then there's the mosquitoes, and yeah, the body's, you know, always assaulted, isn't it, by one thing or another. So we continue to fuss. You know? Yeah. Okay. What? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 175. Having fallen in this way, if my desires are unable to be filled, ah! Finally, Shanti Devad understands me. My desires are unable to be filled. Oh, but next, now there's two more lines. Yeah. If my desires are unable to be fulfilled, even by everything upon this earth, what else will be able to satisfy them? I know what will satisfy me. Because none of this stuff satisfies me. I'm going to develop serenity. I want to get the concentrations, the four dhyanas, the four formless realms. They say the bliss in those realms is exquisite. Yeah. So I need a really quiet place to meditate. Because serenity is making your mind quiet. So it's got to be externally quiet and internally quiet. So I'm sitting and meditating to get serenity. Who's crunching that paper? There's noise out there. Yeah, you hear that noise? There's noise everywhere. There's birds chirping. Oh, God, you know, don't the birds know I'm meditating? Yeah. They should only chirp during my break time. Back to my meditation. Okay. Then... There's a Pekka. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-hmm
am dying of starvation. Yeah. Yeah. And then Karuna joins in. Yeah, my tree hears it. So does Mudita. We're undernourished. We're so hungry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then they, you know, you're, you're meditating on serenity and the cat jumps in your lap. Oh, hello. What do you want? Feed me. I just fed you. Feed me again. <laughs> I'm dissatisfied. Oh, always dissatisfied, Upeka, my goodness. Your name means equanimity. You don't have any equanimity. You should be named, you know, unsatisfied. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, so your perfect retreat to develop serenity and attain... The fourth Diana, you know, it's, uh, oh, mm, that didn't work. Yeah, I meditated for a whole week, <laughs> and still I'm distracted. I don't understand why. Yeah. Okay, so what, even if I'm unable to be fulfilled, even by everything upon this earth, what else will be able to satisfy? You know? And you look around, and that's what we're doing all day. Something to satisfy me. Yeah? And it lasts for two seconds at the most. And here, you know, I always come back to the story that I've told you many times about my high school friend who wanted a Porsche. Yeah. And I heard he drove me to, we went to Sunday school together, so he would drive and I would sit and listen to, to his telling me how much he wanted a Porsche. Yeah. Every Sunday back and forth. And sometimes we complained about the rabbi in between there. Because we didn't believe anything he was saying, um, you know. But you know, so much he wanted that Porsche, and he was so mad at his parents, you know, because he wanted one and it was going to make him happy. And his parents didn't, parents didn't buy him a Porsche, and then. You know, finally he graduated. He went to work and yeah, saved his money, got a Porsche. And then still not satisfied. Yeah, still not satisfied. I want more. I want better. I don't know what he wanted after. He got the Porsche and it wasn't satisfying him because we weren't in touch for a long time. Yeah. So this is a good thing, you know, when we can see our mind being very dissatisfied. Yeah, this isn't right. That's not right. People don't appreciate me. They don't listen to me. I'm talking about something incredibly important and they interrupt and they cut me off and I have my beautiful suggestions and then nobody listens and, you know. And then just, it's interesting to, when you see your mind complaining like that, the self-centered mind is going crazy, you know. Well, what would satisfy me at this moment? Yeah. And, you know, what we find is that none of the eight worldly concerns actually satisfy us. They only create more problems. Yeah. Because we want more of this and we don't want that. One seventy six. Being unable to fulfill all my desires though desiring to do so. I mean, we don't lack enthusiastic perseverance for 
pursuing what we want, do we? Yeah. Being unable to fulfill my desires, though desiring to do so, disturbing conceptions and a dissatisfied mind will ensue. However, if I do not depend on any material things, the exhaustion of my good fortune will be unknown. Okay? So, I have all these desires. I want this. I don't want that. You know? And in our regular life, it's usually material things, isn't it? Sense objects. Yeah? It might be, you know, turn the heat up, turn the heat down. But that's still a sense object. It might be pleasant ego-pleasing words, we want some uh, appreciation, we want acknowledgement, whatever it is, you know, it's still sense, sense objects. Okay, so even though I'm trying to get what I want, my disturbing conceptions and dissatisfied mind keep coming back. I'm not getting what I want. I should have this, I should have that, Yeah. We really become like little kids. I was, yeah, it, it's it's so interesting. I was watching one little video clip yesterday, and Chris Christie, you know who he was, the the former governor of New Jersey, yeah, who is now running for president, and. Uh, he was doing a town hall meeting and speaking about one of our favorite people. And he was saying, uh, you know, because our favorite person had just responded to, oh, something, you know. Oh, yeah, he had made fun of Chris Christie. And, uh, and also he was responding to, to, talk of indictments and things. And and so he was, you know, fussing like he usually fusses. And Chris Christie is saying he used to support this guy, you know, and uh, said, he's just like a little child throwing a temper tantrum. Yeah. And that that's often what it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Because what does a kid do when they throw a temper tantrum? Yeah. I didn't do it. I did nothing wrong. It's the other people's fault. This is a witch hunt. It's all a hoax. People are trying to get me. Yeah. But I'm really the number one and they don't appreciate. Yeah. So it, it's like, you know, a little kid does. And and we act the same way when we don't get what we want, don't we? Yeah. We pout. We stamp our feet. We create a scene. We throw things. Yeah. Sheep number 58. <laughs> Gets tossed across the room. Yeah. Serenity Sloth is just trying to sleep. We should put serenity on this tree, yeah? Sloths hang upside down. Yeah. So, yeah, serenity sloth is just trying to get some sleep, and you know, we, uh, we throw delightful dinosaur. Is it a delightful dinosaur at him? No, oh, I'm sorry. You haven't. You two haven't met Serenity Thought Sloth and Delight, Delightful Dinosaur. You, you will. Yeah. Have you met Buddha Bear yet? Online. Okay. You'll get to meet him in person. Yeah. Have, have you met Buddha Bear? Oh, you don't know about Buddha Bear. Oh. If you're nice, we'll introduce you. <laughs> Okay, but if I don't depend on any material things for my happiness, if I don't see those things as my happiness, 
the exhaustion of my good fortune will be unknown. Okay, the exhaustion of my good fortune, the exhaustion of my virtuous karma will not be un, will be unknown. In other words, my virtuous karma will not be exhausted. Okay. So how is our virtuous karma exhausted? Our kitties are a very good example of this. Yeah. They had the throwing karma that wasn't so good. They wound up in a cat body. Yeah. But their completing karma was virtuous karma because these kitties have it a lot better than some human beings do. Yeah. So their virtuous karma of sense pleasure is getting burned up. Yeah. And they don't have the ability really to create any more virtuous karma because their minds can't understand what to practice and what to abandon. Okay. So there's are examples of the virtuous the uh, virtuous karma, the good fortune being exhausted. Um, and so if we live like that too, just use the virtuous karma being consumed by our chasing this sense pleasure and that thing and the other thing, yeah, then all of that good karma is going to be consumed in a future life, yeah, even if we're born as a human being, we may be an impoverished person, which will create uh, obstacles to being able to practice, you know. And if we don't have the good karma to have a good rebirth, then it'll be even worse. We may wind up like the kitty that showed up here a few days ago. Yeah. Wild cat roaming around. That kitty was fortunate. It got taken to a, to a shelter. Yeah. It doesn't have to live in the wild. Okay. But, you know, however, if I do not pen, depend on any material things for my happiness. Yeah. So then people are going to say, but wait a minute. Does that mean I don't eat? I don't depend on food? Yeah, food gives me happiness. Does that mean I, I don't depend on food? I just uh, eat air <laughs> or something? No, it doesn't mean that. You know, we need to keep our body alive. We eat food. We we clean the body. We get exercise and so on. But the thing is to do it without this mind that's always clinging. Yeah. And as was noted in a recent BBC, the more we cling, the more unhappy we are because we can't get exactly what we want. And so we're stuck in that kind of cycle. Yeah, I want, I want, we get something, it's not good enough. I want more. Yeah, my tree and I go through this every day. Okay. <laughs> She gets some food for breakfast. It's not enough. Yeah? So she lets me know she wants more. I give her more. It's still not enough. Yeah. Then she says, but Venerable Semke said that I'm underweight. You need to give me even more. Okay, Maitri, I'll give you even more. That's still not enough. Yeah? Well, you, you, and then she says, but you're not listening to Venerable Semke. I need more. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> ah, you're so mean. I'm starving, she says. <laughs> okay, but we're exactly the same, aren't we? Yeah. And we laugh at the at how the cats act, but we're the same thing. 
I want this, I want that, you get this, you get that, still not satisfied. And the body especially is never comfortable, never feels secure enough, never feels safe enough. Yeah. You know, we want more. We, you know, huh, where can I go? 177. Therefore, I shall never create an opportunity for the desires of the body to increase. For whatever I do not grasp as attractive, these are the best of all possessions. Okay, therefore I shall never create an opportunity for the desires of the body to increase. Yeah, how do we do that? Yeah, how in the world do we do that? Does it, it mean we keep trying to satisfy the body? That's not going to keep the desires from increasing. That will usually increase them. You know, it's with our mind that we have to do this. Yeah, it's with our mind. And really, you know, whenever our mind starts whining, I want this, I want that. Yeah, to, to just say, okay, yeah, imagine getting it and then ask yourself if you're really happy. And I found this to be something, when I do that, it's very, very helpful, you know, like a special, oh, I want this, I want that, oh, oh, I'm so deprived, I want this, I want that. Okay, then I run the whole show, you know, and you're daydreaming, and, you know, well, I get this and that. And then you say, okay. So then you, you run the whole video, yeah, of getting your desires. And then, you know, because I mean, we've all done this before, yeah, gotten, chased the, after the desire, gotten it, yeah, and then said, uh, yeah, and then, am I happy now? I got what I was craving. Am I happy now? Yeah. And, you know, cr the craving mind it's like drinking salt water. Yeah, the more you drink salt water, the thirstier you get. Even though when you're really thirsty, you think drinking the salt water, at least it's wet, it's going to crunch your thirst. But it doesn't. It makes you thirstier. So in the same way, you know, we run after different night desires, and it only it doesn't satisfy us. You know, it just makes. It increases the desire. So I find that very helpful to just, you know, play the video of I get what I want and then just ask myself, okay, now are you happy? Yeah. I showed that person that I was better than them. You happy now? No, there's still another person who thinks they're better than me. I got to show them that I'm better than them. Is there any, uh, do you ever exhaust the number of people who you think are better than you that you have to compete with and be better than and put down? Yeah. Do we ever exhaust that now? There's always one more. Okay. So I shall never create an opportunity for the desires of the body to increase. Why not? Because it's, the more they increase, the more unhappy and dissatisfied I am. And the more negative karma I create trying to fulfill these desires. You know, when we really want something very badly, yeah. Then, how many of the the ten non virtues do we get involved in? Yeah. When you really want something. Yeah. I mean, that's where stealing comes from. Lying to get what we want. 
bad mouthing others so we can get past them and get what we want. Yeah, insulting people so that they just finally break down and giving us what we want, manipulating other people. Yeah. So it's a it's a dead end. It's a dead end spiritually. But it's really hard to to stop craving all these material things. It's quite hard. Because we've been, you know, our whole mind is used to since beginning this time chasing after them and, you know, getting a little bit of pleasure and stopping the immediate pain. So it's, it's going to take some work. But then Shanti Deva says, for whatever I do not grasp as attractive, these are the best of all possessions. So does that mean that Okay, I'm not grasping something as attractive, so I go around seeing everything as ugly. You know, this is ugly, that's ugly. Yeah, that way I'm not att- attracted to it. So you, you get, you fill your bowl at lunch, you know, oh, this food stinks. That way I'm not going to crave it. No, it's not exactly like that. <laughs> yeah, because then you're going. But we're also taught to have to have pure pure appearance and pure view. <laughs> and now I'm just seeing everything as garbage. Okay, so it's you know sometimes we may have to really focus on the undesirability or the foulness of different things, you know, so that we can counteract the mind of exaggeration that thinks that they're inherently wonderful and beautiful and desirable. So sometimes, the you know, we uh, like on the meditations on the body, they work very well to, uh, you know, to stop that, that craving. Uh, so sometimes we need to do that. The point of it is to get it so that get our mind so that we don't find those things attractive. It doesn't mean that we then go through our life seeing everything as miserable and filthy and disgusting. Okay? So, yeah, we tend to be extremists. And it's like, so either this is like totally beautiful or it's totally awful. And the the techniques, you know, to see the, unsatisfactory qualities of, of a desirable object, yeah, is designed to get us to just cancel the attraction, not to go to the other extreme. Okay? Because when we don't find so many things, you know, we can still appreciate the beauty of something, but in a different way. You know, you can appreciate the beauty without thinking, I have to possess it. Yeah. As I, oh, yeah, that chocolate tastes good. Yeah. Somebody else is eating it. That's nice. I don't have to eat it. Yeah. Okay. So it's, yeah. For whatever I do not grasp at, as attractive. These are the best of all phenomena. No, all possessions. Yeah? So what we own, we use. Yeah? Like we talked about last week, we, we offer them to the Buddha Dharma Sangha, and then we think that we're using the property of the three jewels. And, you know, you don't want to be attached to the property of the three jewels and crave it for yourself. That's not too cool, is it? Yeah. Can can you imagine like going into his, uh, his holiness's residence and like oh that's a beautiful buddha statue I want a statue I want it. You know. His holiness gets so many copse. I want them. Yeah. Would you feel okay about craving his holiness's things? I wouldn't. 
Yeah. Sometimes I imagine, but then I remind myself, that, yeah, I imagine, oh, yeah, he got off, he gets offered so many sets of the 21 Taras. I wonder if we could have one here. But now that we have, we brought one set of small ones back from Singapore and Venerable Pema has offered the paintings. So now I don't crave His Holiness as sets of 21 Taras. But I had to work on that, you know. Every long life puja, they bring them off. I wonder what happens to them. Do they offer the same set again and again? Yeah? Or does he just, you know, does he have a hundred sets of 21 Taras now? You know, I, I haven't asked him that. <laughs> it's not the most crucial thing to ask His Holiness. But, um, you know, if you think that you've offered all your stuff to the Three Jewels, yeah, and so you don't want to see it as an object of your own craving that you want to possess, then that really helps the mind not, not crave. Yeah. And then you can still use things, but the mind has a different attitude towards them. Okay. Then somebody's going to take this really literally, you know, and say, well, I offered even my toothbrush to the three jewels, but I offered my toothbrush, so now it's their toothbrush? Yeah, can I use the toothbrush of the three jewels? Maybe I need a new toothbrush, one for them, one for me. Yeah. But then, then I have to offer that one to the three jewels too. How do I get a, a toothbrush that I can use? So don't take things too, too literally. Okay, 178. In the end, my body will turn to dust. Unable to move by itself, it will be propelled by other forces. Why do I grasp this unbearable and unclean form as I? Okay, in the end, my body will turn to dust. Yeah, it will. Yeah, it'll all decompose. The worms will have a good lunch. Yeah. I really like the idea, you know, what they did in old Tibet of offering the body to the birds. I mean, it's at least that way, you know, it has some some use to somebody. Yeah. But in our culture, yeah, we treat the corpse as if it were still alive. Yeah. So, oh, that person's going to get hurt if we chop up their body and offer it to the to the vultures. Yeah? Or that's desecrating the body. Yeah? When soldiers get killed in war, we always bring the body back. Yeah? But it, I suppose for the relatives, for grieving, it gives them some kind of closure. But, you know, for the person who's dead, does it really matter? You know, where you're buried and what you look like in the, and you're laid out in the coffin, or and, you know what color f flowers they put on top of your grave. Oh, people are very concerned with this kind of thing, but really, does it matter? I mean, we're reborn in some other place, and. You know, we're probably not going to have the luxury or the ability to to see what people on on this earth are doing with our body. Yeah. And then, what about our obituary? Did they write what I want them to write in the obituary? Yeah. I never told them all my great qualities, so I'm sure it's not in the obit, you know. I really should have educated them more so they could really write and show people 
after I'm dead, how wonderful I was. Does that really matter? Yeah. Does it matter? Yeah. Does it matter if you have a mahogany coffin with gold uh, handles or brass handles? They're cheaper. Yeah. Oh, but my relatives, they should have gotten the gold handles to show how much they love me. Really? Gold handles on your coffin show how much people care about you? Okay. So in the end, my body will turn to dust. Unable to move by itself, it will be propelled by other forces. What other forces? Well, you know, somebody will pick it up, take it to the mortuary. You know, you're just another dead body to the mortician. Huh? But they got to sit and, you know, make you look beautiful. That's what their job is, what they get paid for. Yeah, so your hair is a mess when you die, but they have to, you know, comb it somehow so it looks nice. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't like the way they had my they did my mom's hair. Really? Yeah, they should have done it differently. She would have had a fit. If she had seen how she looked, you know, but in Jewish burial customs, you don't do your hair and all that kind of stuff, you know. It's a simple thing. You're not allowed to have expensive stuff, you know. So her hair was just brushed back. Oh, my mom would have had a fit. Yeah, she was so concerned with her hair ever since I can remember. Yeah, she was always concerned with my hair, too. My dad was concerned with my hair. Yeah, one time the family was out. I think my brother and I were both kind of late teens at that time. And we were, they took us to a movie. So we're in this theater. So my brother and I are sitting here and our parents are sitting in back of us, you know. And my dad goes, wouldn't you should know it? Yeah. I think I, I must have been a nun by that time, you know. Because he said, what, what do you know it? My daughter shaves her head, and my son has long hair. Yes. Yeah. Poor dad, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so the, the unpropelled by other forces, mortician's going to take it. Yeah depending on, you, you know, how your religion or your family treats these things, maybe fill you full of all sorts of chemicals, okay, that aren't good for your health. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, do your hair nice. Yeah, they comb my dad's hair pretty well. Um. You know, and, and then they kind of lay it out and, you know, put you, have this little parade to the, to the place where you get buried, put you in the ground, you know, and then everybody throws dirt on you. Oh, my goodness. It's just like kindergarten. They're throwing rocks and dirt. <laughs> huh. Yeah. And then somebody tells you that the way you're throwing the rocks and dirt is wrong. Okay, you should throw them another way. Okay. In in Jewish custom, and this shows how Jewish I was, because I had no idea about this. Anyway, my niece is there and she's taking the shovel and shoveling dirt you know, to fill dad's, the hole in the ground where they put dad. 
so the sh- she turns the shovel upside down. And when you're trying to shovel with the shovel upside down, it's curved this way. It's very difficult. You don't get much dirt in there. So I thought, oh, you know, she, she's just grieving or she's out to lunch or something. So I said, Rachel, you know, turn the shovel over and do it like this. You know, she's a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> a USC graduate lawyer. Yeah. And I'm telling her to turn her shovel over. Um, and, uh, and then, she, and then they tell me, oh, but in Jewish custom, you know, you turn the, sh- sh- the shovel upside down, showing that you're really reluctant. You know, somebody died and you don't really want to, to say goodbye to them. And I said, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but I shoveled with the shovel right side up. <laughs> Because I'm quite practical. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, your body, all this is concern, is run other forces, control the whole thing. Yeah. What they play at the funeral, what music they play. Yeah. My dad really liked, um, you know, how we chant uh, 37 practices. He really liked the melody. This is the practice of bodhisattvas, you know. So he, so we ch- we made a recording of that at the abbey, and I took that to the uh, to the I guess the mortuary, yeah, the funeral, the place. The f- anyway, I took it there and gave it to them, uh, and they were so thankful. They said, "Oh, we've been looking for something Buddhist." To play at, at Buddha's funerals. Thank you for giving us. <laughs> I said my dad's Jewish. Um, <laughs> no, but he really liked that melody. And I think it was auspicious for him. Okay. So, um, now Sandy Devis says, unable. Why do I grasp this unbearable and unclean form as I? Yeah. You know, when you die and the corpse is there, what is the first thing people want to do after somebody dies? What is the first thing they do? They want to wash the body. Yeah. The family wants to come and wash the body. But you're dead. I find it very interesting, you know. I'm going to wash the body. That person doesn't care then. They're dead. I don't know. Do they put deodorant on? (laughs) Perfume and, you know. How do they do that? But it's somehow very important to family. Did they do that with your mom? Yeah. She was cremated. Okay. But sometimes people wash the body. You know, it's the first thing they want to do. No? Okay. Maybe the mortician does that. I'm not sure. Yeah? I said at my job, when a patient dies, the first thing we have to do is wash the body before we put it in the bag. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess just like for, out of respect. And so there's not like a bunch of gunk in the bag, too. And there's not what? a bunch of gunk in the bag. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you think it's for respect? That's why people do that, huh? Very much respect. That's really a common thing in hospitals. That oh. you know, you you were taught to not disparage and to really, you know, it's something very solemn and very respectful. But also, you know, you have to take all the tubes out, and like she says, you have to clean up all the gunk. <laughs> so, yeah, so we do bad, both of those things. Yeah. I think it's it's some kind of war crime to, you know, if you desecrate the body of a dead soldier. You can only <clears throat> put them certain places. Um, that's why we couldn't have a sky burial here. That would be desecrating a body, and you would be arrested and charged. 
even if you say it's important, mm-hmm. but what happened to religious freedom? Well, this would this would override that. Oh. Um, yeah, what you do with bodies. Yeah, oh. yeah, it's very tightly regulated. Huh. What? Oh, I have one of my mothers on me again. I sure do. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't even have to scratch a hundred times to find it. <laughs> She's very good at noticing that. She's done it before. Okay. So why do I grasp this unbearable and unclean form as I? You know, that is a good question. Why do we grasp at it? Yeah. Are you your body? Yeah. We we can easily think, you know, go through, no, I'm not my body. I'm not my body. But we hold on to our body like this. I'm not my body. It's my body is my possession. Why do you crave this thing that's full of so many unclean substances? as my possession. Yeah. If somebody gave you, yeah, one of those dead bodies, you know, even they cleaned it up afterwards, yeah, and then brought it to your doorstep, would you uh, say, oh, that's mine? I want to possess that? I don't think so. So why do we fuss over it so much when it's a walking corpse? Yeah, just think about that. Why do we fuss so much? One reason that comes to mind is it's our gateway for pleasure. Most of our pleasure comes through our body. Yeah. Yeah, through our body, the senses, we hold on to it. But what is it? Yeah. You just meditated on mindfulness of the body. It's a bag of filth covered by skin. Isn't it? Yeah. But we want to make it look good. I want to give it pleasure. And why do we think it's me? Yeah. When somebody looks at you and says, Oh, you're so ugly. I mean, people are too polite, but let's say, you know, somebody comes, You're so ugly. Yeah. Or you stink to high heaven. Or you're fat. Or you're too skinny. Do you have an eating disorder? Yeah. Or why do you cut your hair like that? Or your makeup smeared? <laughs> or why don't you wear some makeup? You would look so much better. We get very insulted if somebody says something like that, don't we? Yeah, we're so insulted. How dare you say that? You know, my feelings are hurt. Yeah, my feelings are hurt. You, you know, disparage my body. Does the body care that it was disparaged? Does the body say, hey, wait a minute. You know, you can't talk that way about me. Yeah. It's just a body. I mean, okay, definitely when it's a corpse, it's not going to sit up and say, okay, do my hair again. <laughs> but even, you know, now, it's like a war- walking corpse. But we fuss so much about it, you know, and they said they insulted my body. How could they? This is mortally wounding. 
you know, I have lost all my self-confidence. Because yeah. ever since I was in grade school, the kids always teased me about my body. Yeah. And here, as a grown-up, somebody again insulted it. Yeah, so just just look at the body. Does the body itself care? Yeah. Does your does your legs stand up and say, "Hey, you can't talk that way about me." <laughs> yeah. Or maybe your eyeballs go, "Hey, you know, say nice things, please." <laughs> it's so interesting, isn't it? Yeah, the body does not care. Yeah. So what is it that cares about what somebody said to the body? Me, I care. Yeah, so who are you? <laughs> I'm I'm my body. Uh, no you aren't. I'm my mind. So okay, you're you're the mind. Uh why do you care about somebody insulting the body? They're not insulting you. Oh, I should think about that. Yeah. Oh, I know why. Because in the same mouthful, they said, you're fat and you're stupid. So they're insulting my mind too. So that's why I care. Yeah. Somebody says you're stupid. And does mine poke up and say, wake up and say, oh, I'm not stupid. Yeah. Don't you insult me. Yeah, a bodiless mind. Yeah, just the mind by itself. Does it say, you can't insult me? You can't say that about me. Yeah. Yeah. Then your eye consciousness is going to say, oh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not stupid. I can see well. So they're not talking about me. I'm not upset. And your auditory consciousness says the same thing. And so does your olfactory, your gustatory, your tactile consciousness. They all say, oh, I don't, I don't care. Oh, it must be mental consciousness that's so attached to this. Okay, mental consciousness. Somebody said you're stupid. Yeah. Who's stupid? What's stupid? Yeah. So you start trying to investigate who got insulted. Yeah. Is it your body? Is it your mind? Which consciousness? Yeah. But when we grasp any of those things as I or mine, then we get very insulted. Yeah. But who's grasping? Who's the person saying, you know, you can't talk that way about me? When you're not your body, you're not your mind. So who's so upset? So I'll play with that one for a while. Okay. So maybe. Some questions or comments? Some weeks ago, I saw a headline that Martha Stewart, at the age of 80, had been on the cover of some kind of fashion magazine and Sports Illustrated. <laughs> and this woman op-ed editor was like, you know, how old can you, can we just stop having to be hot at some point? <laughs> you know, just the pressure <laughs> on even an 80-year-old woman to appear half naked and attractive yeah. on the magazine cover. Yeah. And it's kind of scary to see that 
yeah, that's what. Yeah, when will it stop, right? And that you're not valued for your intelligence or your wisdom or your kindness, but some sagging flesh to make look perky, I don't know, and yeah. airbrush. And yeah, it was just really sad that that's what the culture values. Yeah. Did they dye her hair for the shoot? Really? I know, she looked very um, yeah, enhanced in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> it was just kind of terrifying it's like huh that's what you're supposed to look like at 80 that's just not real yeah. i mean and can't you just leave a woman alone or a person alone to be old I don't yeah. <laughs> leave me alone i want to be old and like ugly <laughs> But who cares if we're old or ugly? Yeah. Any other comments? Yeah. Maybe this is just me, but I was thinking about this idea of, oh, you know, someone insults your body, but your body is not you. I feel like, I think many people get easily upset, as, as you know, um, even if it's something that they think reflects on them, you know, it's like, oh, your dog is is ugly. Your child is stupid. Your house is a terrible color. I feel like, so that notion of not just even, oh, my body is me, but just anything even related to me, if someone yeah. says something bad about it, yeah. maybe people would get upset. Yeah. It's grasping I and mine. My house, my kid, my car, my this, my that. Yeah. And we get insulted, like you said, about, anything that we consider mine yeah but as soon as we give it to somebody else and and then it gets insulted we don't care anymore interesting isn't it yeah uh -huh. how can i get past this idea that my body is the vehicle for pleasure and that if i don't have it i won't have any pleasure Examine if that statement is true. Okay. Yeah. That your body is the vehicle for pleasure. And then examine, does your body always give you pleasure? No. So really go through it, you know, even on a day-to-day -day thing from the time I woke up. Is my body giving me pleasure? Is it really this vehicle for pleasure? Yeah. And like, Oh, finally, yeah, oh, breakfast, my body will give me some pleasure. What do you like for breakfast? Sugar. Oh, sugar, that's the best thing for breakfast, yeah. Oh, so I had some sugar, and now my body is giving me pleasure. Okay, that sugar stayed in my mouth for mm, approximately 15 seconds. Then what? Is my body still giving me pleasure after I ate the sugar? No. What's happening? I want another bite with more sugar. But my Danish roll was finished. Where am I going to get another bite with sugar? Hmm. Well, I can complain about the food in this place. Why don't we have Danish pastry every day? Yeah. You know, instead of oatmeal, granola, you know, toast, what? Oh. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't mind if you did that. <laughs> Actually, I prefer muffins rather than Danish pastry. Yeah. So, yeah, what do you like? <laughs> donuts. Oh, that's, yeah, that's pretty good too. Except donuts aren't so good for you. Yeah, neither is Danish pastry or, <laughs> or, or uh, muffins. Muffins must be good for you. <laughs> because, why? Because I like them. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, so just examine moment by moment in your day if, you know, what kind of pleasure does your body give you? 
And what happens after that one bit of pleasure? Yeah. And really look at it very, very closely and, and see, you know, is the body really the vehicle for pleasure? Yeah. And you say, oh, but I get pleasure when I look at my nice hairdo. Yeah. Yeah, your hair really looks good like that. Yeah, who cut it? Who cut it for you? You did? Oh, so you're a secret hairstylist. And I didn't even know it. So if I praise you for your haircut, sometimes people praise me for my haircut. Uh, Seriously, they do. They say, you know, not everybody can wear their hair like that, but it looks looks good on you. Thank you very much. (laughs) <laughs> my little curls <laughs> brush my hair away you know how you're supposed to do in the movies how do they do that you toss it and your hair goes off in the breeze <laughs> no what what is so pleasurable Okay, let's dedicate.